It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, last Thursday, the Standing Committee on Public Accounts tabled its report on the scandal-plagued Orange Air Ambulance Service. It was the unanimous finding of the committee that Minister Matthews was not diligent in pursuing red flags pointing to serious yeah. problems at Orange. Premier, how can you give the minister the position of the President of the Treasury Board when she has a proven track record of mismanagement and failed oversight? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, so I understand, uh, as you've said, that the uh, the report was um, tabled uh, further to a motion or following up on a motion that was led by our uh, Liberal members, and it's a great step. I'm glad that the uh, I'm glad that the report has been tabled, Mr. Speaker. And um, I'm also very glad that there are measures that we believe must be taken that are included in the legislation that is now in the Accountability Act, Mr. Speaker. Um, measures that. The, the former Minister of Health was very clear needed to be put in place in order to make sure that the oversight uh, that's necessary at Orange is in place, Mr. Speaker. And so I hope that uh, I hope that, given the concern that is being expressed by the uh, the leader of the opposition, that he, he and his colleagues Answer. will work very quickly with us to get that legislation passed and get those measures in place, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Premier, in 2012, your current Minister of Health's Director of Communications wrote that staff shortages, delayed responses to save money, poorly designed interiors in brand new helicopters, and a money trail that disappeared in a complex web of for profit spin offs were among the litany of problems. In addition, on May 4, 2011, the Ontario Air Transport Association sent a five-page letter to the current Deputy Premier, Ms. Matthews, detailing major issues at Orange Ambulance, such as conflicts of interest and deficiencies with the medical quality assurance programs. So, Premier, maybe you can shed some light. Why did the Deputy Premier take no action at that time? Well, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, that's actually not uh, the case. The, uh, the former minister did take action. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, it's why there is legislation in front of this House, legislation that would provide greater oversight, Mr. Speaker, and would deal with many of the outstanding issues. The fact is there are many changes that have been made at Orange, and I know the Minister of Health will want to speak to those. But the other fact is, Mr. Speaker, we have legislation before this House. Right. There is a bill that includes the oversight uh, measures that need to be put in place, Mr. Speaker. That legislation has already received some debate. I hope that the Leader of the Opposition and his colleagues will work with us to get that piece of legislation passed so that those measures can be put in place, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, as a former Minister of Health, I can tell you you don't need new legislation to perform your duty and oversight to the people of Ontario. Yeah. She had all the authority she needed, Mr. Speaker. Premier, the million dollar lawsuits against Orange, and there were several, for delay in transport and poor patient care in the years 2007, 2010, and 2011, also should have been red flags for the former health minister. The current deputy premier did not take action as former health minister until 2012, and that was in December of 2012 by which point patients in Ontario had died or suffered amputations because of Orange's neg negligence. I remind you that the minister was first appointed Minister of Health in October of 2009. Premier, patients have been put at risk because of your minister's failure to do her job and protect Question. Ontarians. Will you show real leadership, take responsibility for those patients' deaths, and demand the Deputy Premier's resignation? Yeah. Thank you. Minister of Health. Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have to say that I welcome the report from the Stand Standing Committee on Public Accounts on Orange. And, Mr. Speaker, our government, as well as Orange, have taken many steps to restore the public's confidence in the province's air ambulance service by ensuring that it's accountable, it puts patient first, Mr. Speaker, and respects public doctors. Of the 67 concerns mentioned in the report uh, that was uh, tabled last week, 31 of them, Mr. Speaker, require action. Of those 31 that require action, the ministry has acted upon or is acting upon 28 of those 31 already, Mr. Yeah, speaker. Right. Thank you. New person, the member from Bruce Gray, Owen Sound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. 
Premier, the Orange Air Ambulance fiasco could have been prevented if your former Minister of Health took action, but we all know she did not. Her failure to acknowledge concerns that were brought to her attention numerous times sadly resulted in the death of four dedicated crew members. Not only did the minister ignore letters from those concerned, she intentionally chose not to be open and transparent after the crash. Regarding the OPP investigation into the crash, the all-party committee wrote, and I quote, the minister missed an, opportun an important opportunity to make a public statement regarding the findings in the interest of promoting transparency. Premier, we've known all along that your government's openness and transparency is suspect, so here's your opportunity to prove your commitment. Your your minister failed in her role to protect Ontarians and then intentionally kept quiet about it. If you really believe in openness and transparency, you'll do something about it. Premier, will you ask for your Treasury Board's Question. minister's resignation? Here, here. Premier. Mr. Speaker, welcome back. I reject, I reject the premise of the question, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that action was taken as soon as the former Minister of Health had information. It's Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I don't need the help. Carry on. The member opposite knows full well that there were massive changes made at the Orange Organization. He also knows that there is action that is underway right now, Mr. Speaker. Action has been taken by the Ministry of Health. And the member from Renfrew, come to order. That there's a piece of legislation before Grenville, this House order. that would make further changes to improve oversight at Orange. That bill has been before this House, Mr. Speaker. It needs to be passed, and I hope that, given the concern emanating from across the floor, they will work with us to get that legislation passed. The member from Renfrew, Nicholson, Pembroke will come to order. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier, what you rejected is openness and transparency to the people of Ontario. Premier, after the fatal crash, a man named Richard Jackson testified before committee. Mr. Jackson is the director of the Air Ambulance Program Oversight Branch, which obviously failed to do its job. Despite this, he testified to the committee that provincial organizations do not require increased oversight or even the existing level of oversight given to Orange. The all-party committee strongly disagreed with Mr. Jackson's statement. In fact, Premier, the all-party committee wrote that the problems with Orange, and again I quote, could be attributed primarily to the absence of due diligence and oversight on the part of the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care. It's obvious that both your Minister of Health and her senior staff don't see any issue with what they've done or egregiously didn't do. Sleep Premier, we show Ontario you are sorry and ask for your Treasury Board Minister's resignation. Sleep at the wheel. Uh, Premier. Speaker, let's, just, let's just check the facts here. There has been a piece of legislation before this House since 2012, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, in an attempt to make further changes because, as I said, there were already changes. There have already been changes made at Orange to improve oversight, to change the personnel, Mr. Speaker. But there's been a piece of legislation since 2012 before this House, Mr. Speaker. It is once again before us. The opposition has stalled at committee for more than a year, Mr. Speaker, has not allowed the legislation to go forward. So I say to the members opposite, given their concern, given the uh, anxiety that is emanating from the other side, I hope that they will change their current trajectory. They will work with us to get that legislation passed and make sure that these final provisions can be put in place. Thank you, Speaker. Again to the Premier. It's obvious you, obvious you won't make the right decision and ask for your former Minister of Health's resignation, so let me spell this out for you again. The report, written by members of all parties, clearly establishes a pattern of serious negligence. Your minister failed time and again to do her job. While you want to talk about trust, openness and transparency, this pattern clearly invokes the, the exact opposite. Given the clear pattern of negligence exposed in this report and 17 charges laid by the Federal Ministry of Labour against Orange and thus your government, you would have thought the minister would do the honourable thing and step down. Instead, your government has shown that it will not be accountable to the people of Ontario. Premier, this isn't just dollars and cents we were talking about today. It is mistakes your minister made that contributed to the deaths of four Ontarians. Premier, I will ask you again. Will you demand Our the president of the Treasury Board's resignation? I don't think she will. Premier. Minister of Health. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Mr. Speaker, it's, it's important. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. 
Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And it's important to understand that, on, that Orange is well into a new chapter, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. It's putting the care of patients first. In fact, it transports almost 18,000 patients in a single year. These are the changes. We've made patient care its number one priority. We have a new performance agreement in place, Mr. Speaker, with Orange, a new conflict of interest policy, a patient advocate, Denise Polgar, who works with patients to resolve their concerns. Orange is now subject to freedom of information, Mr. Speaker. And of course, as the Premier has mentioned, for two years we've had legislation in front of this House to pass, which will make further positive changes to Orange. We look forward to the cooperation of the uh, party opposite. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On August 22nd, Ed Clark, the Premier, Ministers Matthews and Sousa, the Chiefs of Staff to Ministers Shirelli and Duguid, were joined by the Premier's Chief of Staff, Principal Secretary, and five top deputy ministers. Speaker, of this august group, whose idea was it to privatize local hydro utilities? Mr. Premier. <laughs> So, Mr. Speaker, this exercise of uh, looking at the assets that are owned by the people of Ontario and making sure that they are working for the people of Ontario and that, in fact, we can invest in the assets that we need now in 2014 and uh, going forward. We ran on this, Mr. Speaker. We made it very clear that optimizing assets and making sure that we could invest in the transit and transportation infrastructure that's needed was a priority for us, Mr. Speaker. And that is exactly what we're following through on. That's the work that Ed Clark has uh, done with his team. He has given us some recommendations, Mr. Speaker, and guarding the public interest, but making sure that we have the ability to invest in uh, infrastructure going forward, Mr. Speaker. That has been a cornerstone of our economic policy. It's what we ran on, yes, and it's what we're doing, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Speaker, we know that the Premier, along with senior advisers, were meeting with Ed Clark early in 2014, and in fact, it looks like the Premier was planning to privatize local hydro utilities a full four months before the budget came down. Now, that sort of privatization will drive up bills across Ontario. So why did the Premier wait until after the budget and after the election to talk publicly, specifically, about her real plan to privatize local hydro utilities? Premier. So, Mr. Speaker, let's just be clear. Um, Despite what the NDP are saying, we asked the Council to retain the government's long-term ownership of these assets. And in fact, what Ed Clark has said, uh, he said on October 17th, we, and I quote, we recommend keeping all three companies, OPG, Hydro One, and the LCBO. So in fact, there is not a sell-off of these companies as the, uh, as the NDP would like people to believe. But the fact is, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party is so trapped in her ideology that she is not able to see she is not able to see the responsible path forward in fact she has not supported the investment in transit she has not supported the investment in infrastructure mr speaker and so Answer. all she can do is stand and criticize a path forward that we ran on Thank and you. we are now implementing mr speaker please, please. You say that, please? Be seated, please. Final supplementary. People of Ontario that are trapped in sky high hydro bills that come from privatization from both that party and that party speaker. That's who's trapped. Now, according to records that we've obtained, the Premier began meeting with her privatization advisor a full nine months ago. They were having extensive meetings. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will come to order. And deputy ministers. But the Premier kept those plans secret, and she still won't say what occurred in those meetings. Is this the sort of openness and transparency, Speaker, that we can expect from this Premier? So, Mr. Speaker, the premise of this question is that somehow it would be irresponsible for a Premier or a leader to begin to think about the issues that 
he or she wanted to run on or the issues that would be contained in a budget sometime before those issues. In fact, the premise of this question says, just make it up on the back of a napkin. That's actually the way to do planning. That's not how we work, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, I have been clear that we were going to look at our assets. It is included in our budget, Mr. Speaker, and the, the leader of the third party can look it up in the budget on page 20, uh, the, our Liberal plan, page 4. We were very clear in our budget and in the plan that we brought to the Nipissing people of Pembroke Ontario that we were order. going to look at these assets. We were going to have experts look at the assets and make sure that, we could, that they were operating, that they were optimized so that we could invest in infrastructure. That's what we're doing, yep. Mr. Speaker. But she didn't tell the people she was planning to privatize hydro. My next question, Speaker, is to the Premier. New Democrats have uncovered records showing that uh, the Premier's privatization advisor, Ed Clark, has been hiring a number of consultants. Our question is a clear one, Speaker, and it's a simple one. Who are those consultants that are telling the government that she, they should be selling our, pri our public assets? So, Mr. Speaker, uh, Ed Clark is working with a team of people. That is absolutely true, including uh, including Francis Lankin. He is working with people who understand the uh, the value of the assets and understand how to make sure that they're optimized, Mr. Speaker. And he is speaking to experts. That is exactly true. He is talking to people who understand in the financial world how to make sure that we make the best decisions possible. That's the responsible thing to do, Mr. Speaker. It would be irresponsible for these to be political decisions. These are decisions that need to be made based on the evidence and based on the advice from people who have the expertise. Ed Clark yes, has gathered the people, gathered the uh, advice that he needs in order to advise us in the most responsible way. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, on March 29, 2004, a member stood up in this House and said, quote, consultants were expensive and of questionable value to the taxpayers of Ontario. Unquote. Now, that same member, the current Premier, is paying consultants to help sell off our public assets. How much public money, Speaker, has been paid to consultants to help privatize our local hydro utilities? <laughs> Mr. Speaker, you know, you take just about any sentence out of context and you can do anything you want with it. The fact is, we have reduced the number of consultants to government in a, a, an ongoing way, Mr. Speaker. That generic statement about consultants, yeah, I think it's, it's very important that we only, we only ask consultants to work with us when we don't have the expertise in-house. And in fact, the previous government had gotten rid of so many people in government, Mr. Speaker, that it was necessary to bring that expertise in. We have done that, Mr. Speaker, and we have reduced the number of external consultants. But when there is a specific question that needs to be addressed, and when there is a time-limited issue that needs to be dealt with, it is entirely reasonable that there be people who are experts who give advice on that. That's what's happening here, Answer. Mr. Speaker, so that we can have the best advice and make sure that the assets that will continue to be owned by the people of Ontario work Thank for you. them to the best advantage. So, well, Speaker, whether it's e-health, IT consulting, paying Don Drummond $1,500 a day for his austerity plan, or paying Metrolink's consultant, Speaker, to create bogus Twitter accounts, this government has a pretty dismal record when it comes to consultants. And now, the Premier, who says she wants to lead the most transparent government in all of Canada, is refusing to say who has been hired to privatize hydro and how much they're being paid. Now, why is the Premier more interested Minister of Economic in the financial well-being of a few consultants than in the being honest with the Ontarians who, who she works for? You know, Mr. Speaker, I'm sure if the leader of the third party were interested in a briefing from Mr. Clark on what he, the work he's been doing, I'm sure we could arrange that. And I think he has provided, I think he has provided information to the opposition parties. But we would be happy to set that up again and let the leader of the third party get that information. But let's not forget what we're talking about here, Mr. Speaker. What we're talking about is making sure that we can, as government, invest in the infrastructure that. We we know is going to be needed now and in the future, just as 
people in this legislature decades ago invested in infrastructure that we needed for today. So we are going to continue this work, Mr. Speaker. We are going to invest in transportation infrastructure, including transit, Answer. because if we don't do that, Mr. Speaker, then our children and grandchildren will not have the infrastructure that they need. We must make that investment now, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Premier, for the last several days, we've heard disturbing stories in the media surrounding CBC radio host Gian Gomeshi. In particular, that his co workers raised concerns with their superiors about Mr. Gomeshi's alleged behaviour towards them and that those concerns were not acted upon. That media attention is now bringing to light many other instances where complaints of sexual harassment in the workplace have not been taken seriously in Ontario. Premier, will you agree to striking an all-party select committee to study sexual harassment in the workplace and how women and men can be made to feel safer at work in Ontario? So, Mr. Speaker, and I, I thank the member opposite for the question. And this is obviously a, a very serious and disturbing issue. Um, I have already asked my staff this morning to uh, give me a briefing on exactly what the uh, the procedures are. And I know that the minister responsible for women's issue is, issues is uh, is prepared to uh, to speak to this as well. But. You know, I just want to say that this is, this is an issue that affects every single one of us. Um, it affects all of us in all of our work situations across, across society, quite frankly. And it affects every single one of us in the sense that we all have to be vigilant and not pretend that um, somehow this issue has been resolved because it's 2014 and we have, uh, we've moved on. It's very Answer. real. What has happened uh, over the, the last week has made it clear that it's very real, and we have to continue to be vigilant in every way that we can in all parts of our lives. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the Premier. Well, the pervasive problem of sexual harassment in the workplace is not confined to just the CBC. Just this past July, my colleague, the member from Dufferin Caledon and critic for the Attorney General, brought to light the issue about an assistant Crown attorney in Peel Region. Rather than investigate a workplace harassment complaint made against the, that Crown Attorney, your Attorney General allowed him to resign and gave him a one-year salary bonus of over $180,000. So the problem is clearly happening in your own government under your watch. So again, Premier, will you agree to striking the All-Party Select Committee to study sexual harassment in the workplace? to provide effective recommendations to combat this serious issue facing women and men in the workplace. So, Mr. Speaker, I am, I am open, to, uh, I'm open to considering what we collectively can do going forward. As I say, I think this is an issue that is, uh, that is with us. It's something that's extremely important. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it starts right with kids in school and how do we make sure that we educate our children so that they, uh, so that they are aware of uh, what's appropriate, what's not appropriate, and how do we then set up the structures to make sure that people are kept safe. So I am, I'm open to doing whatever it is we need to do going forward, Mr. Speaker. I'm not going to commit to a specific process at this moment. As I said, I've already asked my staff to uh, pull together the, uh, the information that we need to know uh, in terms of what we should be doing going forward, but I'm open to, I'm open to having a conversation yes, with the, uh, the opposition parties about what we might do collectively. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. On Thursday, New Democrats moved a motion in the Gas Plants Committee so that we would ensure that Peter Feist and Laura Miller could come and testify about the wiping of computers in the Premier's office. Every Liberal member of the committee voted against hearing from Peter Feist, the man who the police allege used military-grade software to wipe computers in the Premier's office. They also voted against hearing from Laura Miller, the Deputy Chief of Staff who apparently brought him in. Ontarians looking for answers just had the door slammed in their face. Why is this government only content to promise accountability and transparency, but never actually deliver on it? Thank you, Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I thank the member opposite for, uh, for asking the question. I, I remind the member opposite in his own question, he talked about a police allegation. 
which means, Speaker, that the, the investigation that police is conducting right now uh, should remain the primary focus. Please. Speaker, uh, police has been, has been um, working on this issue. We should let the OPP conduct an investigation uh, during the committee hearings when uh, OPP commissioner, uh, former commissioner uh, Chris Lewis came and uh, the detective who's been working on this case, uh, Mr. Andre Duval, they both said, Speaker, uh, that uh, the parliamentary committee should not be uh, inter interfering um, in, a in a live police investigation. We should respect uh, the, the OPP's authority yes, and sir. let them finish their work. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. The Liberals voted on Friday to continue to barricade the truth from coming forward in regards to the gas plant scandals. The members from Durham, Scarborough Southwest, Mississauga Streetsville, Halton and Beaches East York voted to protect Laura Miller and Peter Feist. They voted to protect Liberal insiders. They voted to deny Ontario's answers about the veil of secrecy around the $1.1 billion gas plant scandal. Liberals wiped computers in the Premier's office to whitewash the gas plant scandal. Now Liberal members are protecting the insiders who did the wiping. Why is this government, again I ask the question, only content to promise accountability and transparency question. but never actually deliver on it? Uh, speaker, speaker, let's examine let's examine the facts here. For three years, committees of the last parliament uh, have been looking into this particular matter. Over 90 witnesses have appeared uh, before the committee and have been examined uh, by by the committee. 145 hours of testimony, Speaker, has been has been pre uh, presented, and over 400,000 documents uh, have been considered uh, by the committee. Speaker, it is time to start the report writing. In fact, even the members of the third party, the member from Bramley, Gold Martin himself, back in April, a few days before the right. election was called, uh, had put forward a motion, Speaker, in the Justice Committee that the committee should uh, start the process of report writing. Speaker, we're happy to see that the members of the committee have decided to work on the report. It is time Answer. that we get recommendations from the committee uh, on, on the things that they've been able to uh, uh, analyze uh, during the investigation. Thank you. Thank you. A new question? The member from Kitchener Centre. Uh, Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Premier in her role as the Intergovernmental Affairs Minister. Welcome back. Uh, Premier, I had the chance to sit in your chair last week while you were away, and we'll say the view is very different from down there. Uh, <laughs> trade missions are a key part of developing our economy here in Ontario. According to the Conference Board of Canada, about every $100 million increased in exports creates about 1,000 new jobs. So developing relationships with foreign governments and businesses can certainly help us to grow our economy. And China is a very key player. Last year, our goods to China increased an astounding 10%. That is $2.2 billion. So, Speaker, can the Premier please inform this House of the success of this trade mission and what it means Question. for jobs and the economy here in Ontario? Minister of Affairs and Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I was uh, I was very pleased to have the opportunity to travel with the Minister of Economic uh, Development, Employment and uh, Infrastructure, and the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration and International Trade to China, Mr. Speaker, because it's so important that we have a partnership with this huge economy, uh, which is China, Mr. Speaker. We also travelled with 60 businesses and organizations, so wow. this is about government facilitating the connections between businesses here and businesses in China, Mr. Speaker, and in, in order to do that, we needed to make that contact. So what happened was our mission attracted, Mr. Speaker, new investments that will create new jobs. And this is a two-way street, Mr. Speaker. This is, about, this is about investment in Ontario, and it's about partnerships with businesses in China. So I'm pleased to tell the House that Ontario attracted yes, about a billion dollars in new investment by Chinese companies, and that will lead to the creation of 1,800 new jobs, Mr. Speaker. Please. You see it, please? You see it, please? Uh, 
I'll jump to warnings if you want. Supplementary. Thanks, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the Premier for that answer and for all her efforts to bring jobs to the province of Ontario. I was very excited to learn, as many other people were in my riding of Kitchener Centre, that we are going to be getting a new steel nail manufacturing plant in our community. That's about 80 jobs, so that is really great news. Uh, I know that there are other communities that are also going to— The uh, member from Hamilton East Stony Creek will come to order. And in the next voice, I'll probably ask him to get to his seat so I can admonish him even further, and the Minister of Energy will come to order as well. Finish, please. So, Mr. Speaker, I mentioned the, uh, the new plant coming to Kitchener. There are other communities that are also going to benefit from this trade mission. Mr. Speaker, can the Premier offer some other details on other success stories from her trade mission in China? Question. Thank you. Th thank Minister. you. Uh, Minister of Citizenship, Immigration and International Trade. Minister of Citizenship, International Trade. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker, for the question. It's really a great uh, trade mission, Speaker. It's great because it is very, very successful. The successful mission reinforced the strength of Ontario's company and Ontario brand globally. Speaker, I want to tell the House about some of the trade deals that were signed during the mission. Huawei announced a major expansion to its Ontario operation value at $210 million that will create 325 jobs, including 250 positions for engineers and researchers, and at least 75 new marketing, sales and support positions. Speaker, Yiwu North America Corporation Allows a hundred million investment and to establish a new trading centre in Stouffville. The first phase of the project is expected to create 800 jobs. Speaker, this investment. Thank you. China Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The member from Del Duffer and Calvert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Long-Term Health and Care. Health care. Try that again. My, my question is to the Minister of Health and Long Term Care. Minister, I've asked you previously to reverse the Central West CCAC's decision to limit the number of new patients it helps due to its supposed lack of funds. What I find is interesting is while the Central West CCAC continues to claim they don't have enough money, their CEO was given another $24,000 increase in her salary in 2013, which brings it up to, wait for it, $267.333.47 a year. Minister, why is frontline care consistently prioritized below executive care at the Central West CCAC? Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I appreciate the question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about the investments that we're making in through our lens to our CCACs to increase our investments on that important area of home and community care. And Mr. Speaker, this year alone, we've increased our investments in home and community care, including to the Southwest Lynn, by $260 million, Mr. Speaker, and that number actually is going to increase to $750 million by 2017. So we understand that it's important. Member from Renfrew, Nipissing Pembroke, is warned. Finish, please. So I know the member opposite understands that we have a formula as well as we look to our lens that have that local and regional Answer. expertise to make sure that our CCACs are receiving the funding that they require based on need and the services that they provide. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, I think it's time for you to start asking some questions about where those investments are going, because clearly they're not going the right place, the Centre West CCAC. My office continues to receive regular complaints about Central West CCAC's failure to provide access to personal support workers. In one example, an 87-year-old man who suffered a severe heart attack has been refused access to a PSW. Instead, his daughter was expected to care for him, but she too has physical ailments that limit her capacity to care for her dad. You have allowed CEO salaries to continue to increase while ignoring the core services of frontline care. Minister, I asked you this in July, and you ignored me. I'll ask you again today. When will you prioritize frontline services over executive pay Question. at the Central West CCS? Minister of Health, Long Term Care. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, actually, I apologize. I meant to say Central West CCAC uh, in the, uh, my first response. And, Mr. Speaker, for this entire government, the issue of executive compensation within the broader public sector, including our CCACs, is an, an issue of importance and great concern. And in fact, we've recently reintroduced legislation that, uh, if passed, will actually address the specific issue that the member opposite has uh, has spoken to. And I also expect Mr. Member Speaker, from our CCACs to recognize that they are spending taxpayer dollars and they need to spend those dollars effectively and efficiently. And that includes issues concerning compensation. Mr. Mr. Speaker, but I, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I, I, uh, we, in fact, in terms of looking at our CCACs, I struck a table to Answer. look at home and community care. I expect that early in the new year, I'm going to have the results, the recommendations coming back from that table to provide further guidance on how to approach this important sector. Thank you. New question, a member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. People in Ontario expect their health care system to help them, not to make them sick. But this government risky experiment in offloading surgery to private clinic has failed to live up to that standard. Patients like Anne Levac and Tracy Martin have contracted a life-threatening infection at unsafe private clinic, while Ontarians were left in the dark about those infectious outbreaks. And now, more alarm bells are ringing before fully one in seven private clinic is failing to comply with safety standard. One in seven, Speaker. This is completely unacceptable. How can the minister allow more private clinics to set up shop when so many of them are putting patients' health care in danger? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the question. Mr. Speaker, my top job is to ensure the protection and the safety and health and well-being of Ontarians, and that is a job that I and a responsibility that I take extremely seriously. And to that end, it's important that Ontarians not only have the confidence that they need in all elements of our health care system, but they also have the information required to make those informed decisions. And Mr. Speaker, uh, when this issue uh, first came up several weeks ago, I asked, uh, in fact, I've uh, asked for my reg all regulatory colleges, many of which, and the CPSO, for example, is the one that have over has oversight currently of our independent health facilities. I've asked them to report back to me all of the regulatory colleges on measures that they're going to put in place in terms of increasing transparency and accountability of the services of those entities that they have oversight for. And Mr. Speaker, specifically, I've asked that transparency be a priority objective in each of their business plans, and I've asked them to disclose more information. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, I've also asked uh, Health Quality Ontario. Yeah. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the facts are 44 clinics have fallen short of basic standard in the last three years, but under this Liberal government, patient safety takes a back seat to full throttle expansions of private clinics. The number of private clinics has skyrocketed, Speaker. 31 per cent increase in the last three years, even though Ontarian, Ontario does not presently have the layers of oversight, transparency and reporting needed to safeguard the public. And even though at least 20 patients have contracted serious infections at these clinics, it's time to put a stop to this liberal fail experiment and put Ontarian safety first. Will the minister agree to immediately declare a moratorium on new private clinics in Ontario? Question. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And in addition to asking our colleges, colleges to those that have inspection programs to proact proactively and publicly disclose full, detailed, useful information with respect to each of the inspections that they conduct, I've also asked for Health Quality Ontario to do a review of our independent health facilities and how we can actually further establish and a, me a mechanism of accountability to give confidence to Ontarians on the issue that the member opposite has just mentioned. And I know, Mr. Speaker, that the opposition agrees with my approach because uh, just several weeks ago, uh, the member opposite called these actions that the government is taking, quote, a huge, huge victory. And she also stated that she's very happy with the step that he, meaning myself, has taken. And with this letter addressed to all of the colleges, Answer. I expect movement. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Thank you. Your question? Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Community Safety and Correctional Services. 
Mr. Speaker, my riding of Halton is one of the fastest growing areas in the country, and we have a lot of young families living in the region. Keeping Halton residents safe is something that is very important to me. Lately, the people of my community and people in communities across the province are concerned about the threat of carbon monoxide gas. Carbon monoxide is a threat to our families and loved ones because it is odorless and colourless and is a silent killer. More than 50 people die in Canada from carbon monoxide poisoning each year. On average, 11 of those are in Ontario. But, Mr. Speaker, the real tragedy is that each and every one of these deaths is preventable. As the minister charged with the safety and security of Ontarians, fighting this silent killer is part of your responsibility. Question. Mr. Speaker, through you to the minister, can you please tell us what steps you have taken to help protect our friends and our family from the thank threat you. of carbon monoxide? Thank you very much, Speaker, and I thank the member from Halton uh, for raising uh, such an important Good issue and asking this question today. Speaker, as, uh, as the member mentioned, carbon monoxide gas is a silent killer that continues to claim too many lives um, in our province. And that is why, Speaker, our government is very much committed uh, to working with all MPPs and, and stakeholders and partners to ensure that no more Ontarians lose their lives to carbon monoxide poisoning. Special, uh, Speaker, I would like to acknowledge the hard work done by the MPP from Oxford uh, in bringing forward his, uh, his bill. 77 that was passed unanimously uh, in this uh, legislature. Uh, speaker, uh, that bill came into effect on October the 15th, making it mandatory for all homes in Ontario to have carbon monoxide alarms. Installing a carbon monoxide detector speaker uh, in your home is perhaps one of the simplest Answer. and most effective way to alert you and your family to the presence of this lethal gas. I encourage everybody to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your action on this important issue. I would also like to acknowledge the efforts of the member from Oxford on this. I am certain that making CO alarms mandatory in homes will help save lives in my community and across Ontario. In fact, just recently, Recently, the Milton Fire Department received a donation from Union Gas to help buy smoke alarms and carbon monoxide detectors for families who don't have the equipment already. The work of our government on protecting Ontarians is never complete, and there is always more action to be taken. Minister, my community and all Ontarians need more information about your action on this issue beyond this legislation. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can you please provide more details on how you plan to protect Ontarians from the dangers of carbon Question. monoxide? Thank you, Minister. Thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the law requires that carbon monoxide alarms be installed in the service rooms and near all sleeping areas in multi-residential buildings. It also introduces annual testing, battery replacement, and other requirements to ensure that carbon monoxide alarms in these residences are in good working order. But, Speaker, introducing new rules, rules are just not enough. We need to ensure that each and every Ontarian understands the importance of having a working carbon monoxide alarm in their home. And that's why, Speaker, this week uh, is the first ever carbon monoxide awareness week uh, in our history as a result of the legisl uh, legislation that was put forward by MPP from Oxford. So, Speaker, we need to take this week as an opportunity and every single day to spread the word about the dangers of carbon monoxide and the necessity of a detector in our home. And I encourage each and one of uh, all members here today and through Answer. the members, their constituents, in encouraging uh, members of our community to purchase a carbon monoxide alarm and install it in their home Thank today. You. Thank you. Question? The member for Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Welcome back. Uh, my question is to the minister responsible for the Pan Am Games. Minister, six weeks ago you sat in the Estimates Committee and you said this about Tim Horton Stadium in Hamilton. This is eight or nine months prior to the Games and it's operational. But Tim Horton Stadium in Hamilton had to miss a Pan Am test event just this past weekend. It was the University Women's Soccer Championship because the ven venue still isn't ready. We're hearing now it may be ready for the Ticats' final home game, a full two months after the Labor Day drop-dead date. Minister, since this project has never been on time, how about some accountability from that side of the House? Who's being held responsible for yet another deadline missed 
at Tim Horton Stadium in Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd, I'd like to start by saying the changes to the construction timeline will not have any effect on the Pan Am Para Pan Am Games next year in Hamilton in 2015. And I'd like to remind the member opposite that through our investment, the City of Hamilton is receiving a brand new 22,000 seat Amazing. stadium. Wow. And this is a $146 million investment, and we're happy in this wow. house to be part of that, to be part of that initiative to leverage these games in order to build a, a strong stadium, strong support in the city of Hamilton. And uh, the Tiger Cats have actually played, I believe, seven games there, seven. and they're undefeated currently. Undefeated. So I want to congratulate the Tiger Cats and the people of Hamilton for the great work. And Mr. Speaker, I have a bit more to talk about the infrastructure and the supplemental. Speaker, the fact of the matter is the minister has said the venue would be ready, and clearly the venue is not ready. They've had to move events from there time and time again, and no one has been held accountable on that side of the House. Minister, the list of problems at Tim Horton Stadium includes electrical work, elevators, landscaping, and the press box. It goes on and on. There's all kinds of problems there. Stop. Please finish. Thank you. Let's move on from Tim Horton Stadium in Hamilton. Let's move on to the velodrome in Milton because it's not ready either and it had test uh, functions that were cancelled earlier this fall as well. They were supposed to have an event there and it's behind schedule too. Minister, you've repeatedly told us the venues will be on time and on budget. Nobody believes that Question. anymore. Well, now they're missing events that are actually in those schedules that you've been talking about. Who ultimately Thank is going to be held responsible? Thank you. Good Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I just want to. I want to thank the people of Hamilton for their support for the Pan Am and Para Pan Am Games. And in fact, Mr. Speaker, this morning I found out that of all of Ontario, Hamilton uh, is volunteering the most people for the Pan Am. Wow. Games. With 2,200 people who have signed up from Hamilton. And I want to thank the people of Hamilton for their investment in these games. They're excited about a $146 million investment. They're excited for the Pan Am and Para Pan Am games, and they're excited because their team is undefeated currently in that new stadium. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. To the Premier. Fort Francis was devastated when their local mill idled in 2012. <clears throat> now there is renewed hope given that a, local, or that a company is looking to purchase the mill. Getting the mill up and running could mean 200 direct and 1,000 spin-off jobs, as well as a $100 million annual injection into the economy. But Expera, the company ready to buy the mill and create jobs, keeps running up, up against major challenges that the town of Fort Francis is confident that this government can solve. In a recent letter to the town of Fort Francis, the Premier wrote that she, quote, recognizes the benefits that such a deal could bring, unquote, and that her government is, quote, committed to the forest industry and to preserving and creating jobs in northern Ontario, unquote. My question is, question. what is the Premier ready to do to help the town of Fort Francis and ensure that we can get this mill up and going? Thank you. Minister of Natural Resources. Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Speaker, thank you very much, and I want to thank the member for the question. Um, like many uh, in northwestern Ontario, I'll, I will say I was very excited when the negotiations began between the owner of the mill and the potential purchaser of the mill. And, I would say that I allowed myself to get a little bit more optimistic than I might generally in situations like this. We need to remember that the mill is a privately owned facility. Uh, there are multiple components to whether or not a deal could get done, and at the end of the day, at least to this point, and we're still hopeful that things can get back on track and restart, but at least up till this point, Speaker, the two parties have decided that they are not going to move forward with the mill to the, or to the uh, negotiation in the cell. I would say, though, to the town of Fort Francis, and I did call Mayor Avis immediately upon finding out about this, had a great conversation with him. We do understand that Mayor Avis and the town of Fort Francis will continue to work towards a deal and do anything they can, and we're there to support them very much in that effort in any way that we can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. The Crossroot Forest is one of the most productive forests in Ontario, but the forest is in the hands of a company that won't guarantee the prospective buyer, Expera, a cost-competitive 
the cost-competitive fibre it needs to run the mill. The town of Fort Francis has asked for a seat at the table to ensure that its local forests can create jobs in Fort Francis as part of an enhanced sustainable forestry licence, but the minister has slammed the door. With the stroke of a pen, this government can ensure that Fort Francis has a role in managing its own forest so that there is enough fibre to keep people working. Will the Premier listen to the town of Fort Francis and First Nation communities and instruct her Minister of Natural Resources to approve the Enhanced Sustainable Forestry, forestry Licence for the town of Fort Francis? Minister. Speaker, listen, I, I think it's important to note that the system of forest tenure that we're operating under currently now in the province of Ontario was a system that was brought in by the NDP in 1994. And we've made a significant commitment to move away from that system, system with tenure modernization. There are four priority ESFLs in the province of Ontario currently being worked on right now. But it's important, Speaker, to say that even if there was tenure modernization in place, even if there was an ESFL in this particular case, it's only one piece of the components necessary to get a deal done. At the end of the day, the mill is still privately owned. It's not in bankruptcy. So at the end of the day, even if the ESFL discussions had begun some time ago, that is in no way a guarantee that a deal could have been done here. I will say, Speaker, we're interested in working with the town in any way we can. We understand yes, the impact of this mill to that community and all of northwestern Ontario, and we'll continue to do whatever we can to try and enhance the opportunities around the community. New question. New question. The member from uh, Simcoe North. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. Minister, the Ombudsman in his scathing report says there are 800,000 children in independent child care uh, in Ontario up to the age of 12. The Ministry of Education reports they have 292,000 licensed spots in Ontario covering children up to 12 years of age as well. These spots are full and tens of thousands of children are on subsidized wait lists. According to a survey by the Child Care Providers Resource Network, 40% of independent child care providers will close their doors if Bill 10 passes with the proposed raci restri racial restrictions. That is 320,000 spaces, Mr. Minister. The bill is an even bigger disaster than when we originally calculated. Minister, are you really going to push this disastrous bill through this House without proper consultation across this province? Thank you. Minister of Education. Yes. Um the, the, I, I think I need to comment on selective use of the Ombudsman, because if you actually look at the breadth of the Ombudsman's report, what he's saying is we need to make changes to the way uh, child care supervision works in Ontario, and we need to work it, make it quickly. That in fact, that what we need to do is make sure that our inspectors actually have the authority that when people break the rules, that they have the authority to fine, and in particular, that they have the authority to close those child cares down. So, yes, we do think, we agree with the Ombudsman, that it is urgent that we pass Bill 10 and Answer. implement his, re his uh, recommendations. That's right. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, Mr. Speaker, the Ombudsman clearly, clearly indicated that this Ministry of Education did not do its job. And Minister, the average cost of licensed care is $140 per month more uh, for child care, uh, independent child care providers than for licensed ones. With the loss of a possible 320,000 spaces, that will cost young families in Ontario an average of $44.8 million more per month. That's per month. And that's if there was even a remote chance of a licensed daycare spot that you brag about. And it's not including the loss of income for roughly 60,000 independent child care providers who don't mind being regulated or licensed or have, or have a registry. If I'm wrong on these numbers, can you enlighten this House with the numbers that you actually Question. have and you're going to pass this bill on? That's what I'd like to see, the real true numbers given to this House and not passed through some fast committee that's going to be time allocated and, and, and really dumped on Thank all you. the young people and all the people Thank that are trying you. to try, provide child care. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Yes, I believe that if you read the uh, Ombudsman report carefully, what you would find is that he said that there are over 800,000 children who are either not in licensed care or not in the care of their mothers. Included in that 800,000 are the people who go to uh, who don't have childcare at all. So all those 11 and 12 year olds who are home alone, it, all those kids who go to grandma's house, all those kids who have a nanny, all those kids who have a babysitter. So in fact, the number that you're using to do your calculations on, which is 800,000 kids in unlicensed childcare, is factually incorrect. So your calculations don't work. But let's go back to the real issue here, Speaker. The real issue is Answer. that regardless of whether children are in a licensed centre, licensed home care, or unlicensed home care, it is our responsibility as a Thank government you. to keep kids safe. That's what Thank you. Can. New question, the member from Sudbury. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Through you to the Premier. Uh, Premier, in my riding of Sudbury, LaSalle Boulevard is a commercial main street used by residents, but it's also the only direct route available for the heavy slurry trucks traveling between the source and the smelter in Falconbridge. The extension of Maley Drive would provide these massive, massive trucks an alternative route, heeding road user safety and taking into account the maintenance of road infrastructure. The city has attempted to get the federal and provincial governments to pay one-third of the project costs. During the election campaign, your government promised $26.7 million for this project, but this is not even one-third of the $120 million projected cost of the Maley Drive extension. So, Premier, through you, Speaker, will your government commit funding, funding the full one-third total cost of the Maley Drive extension? Thank you, Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment and Whatever. Infrastructure. <laughs> We're, we're, we're working on that, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you, though. I, I uh, appreciate the question. I know this is an issue that the uh, city of uh, Sudbury has identified as a priority, and uh, we're going to continue to work with municipalities, Mr. Speaker, on their priorities. We understand the significance of this. Uh, it's a it's a fairly significant ask, but uh, Mr. Speaker, we have a number of programs now that we've rolled out with municipalities, and the key is, Mr. Speaker, we're rolling out these programs, as you would know from our ABLE commitment, on the basis of the way municipalities want us to deal with these programs, Mr. Speaker. In other words, uh, we're looking at half of the programs being a formula-based approach, and the other half, Mr. Speaker, as we get up Answer. in asset management issues, being uh, the other kind of uh, traditional approach, Mr. Speaker. We're going to continue to work with City of Sudbury and other municipalities to ensure Thank that you. their needs are met. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Through you, and you're right, uh, you're right, Minister. The the project is very important to the City of Greater Sudbury for over 20 years, and uh, as well to my colleague from Nickel Belt, uh, Premier Minister. During the election, your government promised the people of Sudbury the money was available for the Mealy Drive extension, but no money has actually been set aside. The funds, your premier, the funds your government speaks of are conditional on matching federal funding. The federal government, if the federal government doesn't pay its share, the province will pay nothing either. Will your government commit to funding the Maley Drive extension unconditional of federal government funding and come through for the people of Greater Sudbury? Thank you, Minister. Uh, the member is correct. Uh, I mean, the commitment that we made in 2014 uh, budget was uh, was conditional on federal funding. And Mr. Speaker, the federal government's got to do their share. Absolutely. The fact of the matter is, when you look at the infrastructure investments we're making, 130 billion dollars over 10 years. The federal government's commitment across the entire country, not just in Ontario, including investments in their own buildings, is 70 billion. Mr. Speaker, that's a far cry from where their investment should be. So yes, Mr. Mr. Speaker, we'll be calling on the federal government to pay their share when it comes to projects like this and projects right across the province, whether that's transit, whether that's roads, whether that's bridges, whether that's water, wastewater projects, Mr. Yes, Speaker. Sir. We need a federal government in this country that's committed to building infrastructure. We don't have that right now. Thank you. New question. The member from Scarborough Agent Park. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. I was very pleased last week to hear from the Minister uh, that his ministry is promoting sports, recreation, active living, priority neighbourhoods. The Minister announced continued support for after-school program, the program that helps children and youth to regain, uh, to ma maintain active, develop healthy, active uh, living, gain confidence and achieve more in school. Given the current statistics on childhood obesity, as a former member of the Healthy Kids panel, I believe the recent announcement by the Minister of investing $13.5 million support the many the recommendations by, by the Healthy Kids panel. I'm also very pleased that we are partnering with over 130 organizations, including my riding of Scarborough Aging Corps, the Aging Corps Community Social Services. These organizations will deliver after school Question. programs to over 400 locations. Speaker, to you to the Minister, can he please share with the members of the House on the expanded after school programs and how we will help you in my thank riding of Scarborough Aging Court. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank the member from Scarborough Aging Court for her work on, uh, on promoting healthy choices, not only in the legislature here, but as a nurse and as a former school board trustee of the Toronto Good District trustee. School Board. Um, what are the best? Her question gives me a, a, an opportunity to talk about this incredible program. My ministry announced uh, last week that we'll be investing $13.5 million into the after-school program. And this Good program idea. will support children and youth who, uh, who will be making healthy choices through positive activities. And I'd like to thank the service providers who, uh, who helped deliver this program, Mr. Speaker, to over 400 locations 400. across this province, and it includes over 21,000 young people who actively participate in these programs. Program activities include sports, arts, craft, personal uh, health and wellness and education, and nutrition instruction. And are, div uh, are di yes, uh, diverted to nonprofit organizations uh, through, uh, throughout the province, and we're very proud of the work that these organizations do, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Speaker, and thank the minister as well for his comments about this fantastic After Four program. And I know, as a former school board trustee, the importance of these programs to reaching out to students after school, but also during the school time. I heard the after school program will incorporate the Pan Am Games as well as the Kids and Play resource of. PPA Kids website. I'm happy the program will allow kids to learn about the games next summer through the interactive activities like Who is Patchy activities to learn about the mascot of the game, as well as identifying the flags of participating countries, as well as creating their own Pan Am flag activities. Speaker, through you to the minister, can he please share with the House some other programs uh, plans for this uh, program after school, but also how to keep our kids healthy, active? After Question. School. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, I'd like to thank the member for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we've been funding this program, the after-school program, since 2009. We're quite uh, proud of the investment we've been able to do because we know when young people go to these programs, they have a safe place to, uh, to learn together, do. to do, the, do their homework, to learn about uh, great nutritional food and uh, great uh, nutritional food choices, to take part in physical activity, but most importantly, Mr. Speaker, to, to have some fun. Thank you. The, uh, the member from Simcoe North on a point of order. Yes, please. A point of order. I, may have, I may have said this, and my colleagues have told me I said this wrong, but I, I want to correct myself on the supplementary to the minister. Uh, I, what I meant to say was the average cost of licensed care is $140 per month per child more than independent child care providers. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. As, um, as all members know, that that is a point of order to correct one's record, and I thank the member for bringing it forward properly. The Minister of Health and Long Term Care on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Better late than never. I believe you find that we have unanimous consent that all members be permitted to wear today Ontario Lung Association pins in recognition, in recognition of Lung Month. The Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is seeking unanimous consent to wear the ribbon. Do we agree? Agreed. Agreed. The Associate Minister of Finance on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, I'd like to uh, welcome to this House uh, Joe Baker, Dean, as well as Michelle Kane, Chair of the School of Hospitality, Tourism and Culture at Centennial College, as well as uh, students from Willow Park Junior Public School who are touring the House today. Thank you. The member from Bramley, Gore Moulton, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, my question I mentioned that the members for Durham, Scarborough Southwest, Mississauga, Streetsville, Halton, Beaches East Miller voted on Friday. Uh, I'd like to correct that to say Thursday. It's actually Thursday that happened. Thank you. Again, correcting the record is a point of order. There are no further points of order, and there are no deferred votes. This House stands adjourned until 1 p.m. this afternoon.